that the problem? Yes, everything is it, it's muted and closed. So I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'll do the one more time. Sorry about that again to all the audience. Uh, I'll do it one more time. Good afternoon to everybody and thank you for joining us this week. Uh, Tyson Seminar Series from the Tyson Research Center at Washington University in San Luis. Today, I have the pleasure to present Dr. Catherine Halshaw, who is as an assistant professor at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Dr. Halshaw earned a dual bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania and her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from University of Arizona. Afterwards, she was an NSF postdoctoral research fellow at the University of California, Davis with Susan Harrison. She was faculty at the University of Puerto Rico, Maya Guess for several years before moving to her current position in Virginia. Dr. Halshoff is building an impressive profile of publications in prestigious journals such as ecology, nymphetologies, and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Her research has been continuously funded by the National Science Foundation for the past 15 years. And she, was uh, she has received numerous other competitive grants and awards from uh, the Puerto Rico Science Technology and Research Trust and the US Fish and Wildlife, among others. Dr. Halshoff's research focuses on understanding the processes and mechanisms that maintain biodiversity. In her research, she integrates long-term empirical data and modeling tools with data science practices to promote a culture of collaboration, diversity, and creativity. Before I hand over the screen to Dr. Halshoff, I want to remind everyone uh, joining us to please leave questions and comments in the YouTube chat section. Without further delay, let me introduce Dr. Catherine Halshoff and her presentation of her recent work entitled, What Can Tropical Ecotones Tell Us About Climate Change? Take it away, Catherine. Great, thank you so much, William. Uh, um, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm very excited to share some new ideas that I've been working on. And so much of what a lot of us do is centered around understanding how organisms, communities, all the way up through global processes respond to ongoing climate change. And today I'll describe how ecotones can be used as a window into the future and why they are important places for asking ecological and evolutionary questions. I'll start with the definition and not because that's good science communication practice, but there's actually been quite a bit of debate about um, the definition of an ecotone. Ecotones are by nature difficult to define and they've been referred to using many different terminologies that I've listed here. Because ecotones are hard to define, the formal definition of an ecotone is pretty complex. So it's this environmentally stochastic interaction zone between ecological systems with characteristics defined in space and time. So that part captures this spatial and temporal dynamics and by the strength of the interaction. Uh, so how strongly connected those ecological systems are, how much flow of organisms or genes there are between the two systems. Part of the difficulty in defining ecotones is because they are these dynamic systems. They're sometimes ephemeral. They're diverse and found in many different forms and across a range of scales from a few centimeters to several kilometers, right? So scale is implicit in how we define what an ecotone is. For example, if we are defining this ecotone, if we are detecting this forest grassland ecotone pictured here, we will overlook smaller ecotones within the grassland community. So for example, where there's exposed bedrock. Uh, 
Despite these challenges, ecotones are important indicators of global and local changes. And so understanding what's happening in ecotones can help us understand these broader responses to climate change. We know, for example, that climate change is a global, gradual phenomenon. So we know that organisms have some built-in capacity to respond to this change. But what we don't know is how organisms respond to this accelerated current rate of climate change, right? For a lot of organisms, it's thought that the current rate of climate change is too much, too fast. But we also know that climate change is more than a global gradual phenomenon. When a forest is clear cut or burned, um, climate change becomes this very local, very abrupt phenomenon, right? These climates now, um, if you wanna call them microclimates, uh, are now vastly different. And the big question is how do organisms respond? This question is important for conservation planning. It's important for thinking, for foreseeing no analog communities and thinking about those novel species interactions. And in scaling up, this question is important for understanding ecosystem level processes, right? How organismal responses translate to things like the carbon cycle. So today I'll demonstrate three examples of how ecotones can be used as windows into this changing world at three very different spatial scales. So I'll start with this plant herbivore example at fine spatial scales. Then we'll increase in scale and talk about a dry forest, cloud forest ecotone at the landscape scale. And I'll end with an example of what ecotones can tell us at continental scales. So I'll start at this small scale and work my way up, uh, beginning with the plant herbivore example. So despite their small size, tropical herbivory is dominated by insects and herbivory is a key ecosystem process. It's estimated that between 20 to 50% of foliar productivity in the tropics is lost to insect herbivores. And of course, those herbivores are depositing nitrogen and phosphorus in the form of frass, making leaf nutrients available in the soil almost instantaneously. Those frass contributions are estimated at about 50% of ecosystem nitrogen inputs via atmospheric deposition and biological fixation. And these frass contributions are estimated at 260% of phosphorus inputs from atmospheric deposition and uh, weathering of bedrock. Insect herbivores are also ectotherms, which means their biology is strongly tied to environmental temperature. So we can theorize that these tropical caterpillar herbivores uh, evolved inside the dark, humid, cool forest understory conditions and th thus operate at suboptima outside of those mature forest conditions. Right, so ectotherms suffer reduced performance outside of mature forest conditions, for example, in young secondary forests because those microclimates are too hot and too hot, too dry. Tropical dry forests are a great place for understanding organismal responses to ecotones because dry forests are highly fragmented Dry forests used to be extensively distributed, but it's estimated about only 2% of dry forests remain intact. And that's because dry forests have lower precipitation than rainforests. They're more seasonal. Um, and because of this, they're more suitable for human populations uh, as well as agriculture and cattle. And by about the 1940s, much of the dry forest globally uh, has had been converted to pasture. Uh, 
And then as the cattle industry collapsed globally, many of those pastures were abandoned, allowing secondary forests to regenerate. And so what you get now are these ecotones between mature forests on the right of this image and younger secondary forests on the left-hand side, right? And they're not always separated by, by a river. It's just one example. And this is the classic story of dry forests in northwestern Costa Rica. In the 1970s, a large tract of dry forests were set aside um, in different stages of succession uh, to create Aria de Conservación Guanacaste, where I've been working for over 15 years now. Um, tropical dry forests of ACG are this mosaic of old growth forests, more mature forests, and young secondary forests, creating this matrix of environments and the ecotones um, in, be in between them. In ACG, there's also been a long history of Lepidoptera inventory. So for over 50 years, Dan Jansen and a team of parataxonomists depicted here um, have recorded almost a million records of caterpillars, including their host plants. And in particular, we know a lot about the natural history and biology of a caterpillar herbivore, Rothschilia lebo, and its host plant, Gassiaria nitida, uh, which conveniently occurs in both mature and young forest stands. So we can make the following predictions, right? That younger forests are hotter, drier, more variable. Because of this, functional leaf traits are less favorable from an herbivore perspective. And as a result, per herbivore performance is reduced in younger forests. Right, so to test these ideas, we collected cocoons in the dry season. And when the adults emerge, uh, you can put the males and females in these mating cages, allowing them to mate. Then once the female is mated, you'll, uh, we wait for her to lay the eggs uh, and for the neonate caterpillars to hatch. And these neonates are full siblings. So this is what's called a split brood design because you can take a single brood and you can do this for multiple females and you'll split that brood between two different habitats, in this case, mature forests and young forests. And then we monitored growth and survival while measuring microclimate and collecting and measuring uh, leaf traits. So things like leaf thickness, uh, leaf toughness, how much water there is, and a trait that I'll talk a lot about uh, today is specific leaf area, which is a proxy of leaf nitrogen as well as plant growth. To answer this first question, are younger forests hotter, drier, more variable? Yes, um, this my, the microclimate differs between mature and young forests. Um, younger forests have lower values of humidity, so lower relative humidity and higher temperatures. Uh, this isn't surprising, but it's something that we wanted to put a number on, just how different these two ecological systems uh, were. To answer the second question, are leaves less favorable in younger forests? So in terms of leaf toughness, leaves are tougher in young forests. They're thicker, they have lower specific leaf area and lower water content. So from an herbivore perspective, yes, leaves are less favorable in young forests. And finally, is performance reduced in young forests? Again, yes. If we look uh, across the day of the experiment, caterpillars tend to have lower body mass they tend to be just smaller in general, and they have higher rates of mortality. There's also a known color polymorphism among caterpillars, including this light morph, a dark morph, and uh, a morph that lies somewhere in between. And we noticed that there were more individuals of the lighter 
color morph in the younger force. And we're thinking that this is a possible uh, thermoregulation response. So at these small scales, ecotones, um, when these ecotones are created abruptly, as in tropical dry forest, as they were in dry forest, organi organismal performance is reduced. Uh, and this is true both of plants and their insect herbivores. And that is something that is a, an artifact that is still present in these young successional forests. So in this first example, we saw how ecotones created by changes in the microclimate can impact organismal responses at these fine spatial scales. And organismal responses to climate change must scale up to impact community composition at larger scales. So in this next example, we'll explore the co composition of communities at an ecotone between tropical dry forests and tropical cloud forests. And when we zoom out at this scale, it becomes very clear that tropical dry forests are not isolated from other tropical forests. Lepidoptera are great examples of this. During the dry season in the dry forest, there are some adults um, of some species that will migrate to higher elevation wet forests. And this is certainly true of other organisms like birds, tapers, cats, um, definitely move between the different forest types. And in part, that's what makes ecotones uh, so rich and dynamic. And this is especially true for Santa Elena Peninsula. So we're still in Área de Conservación Guanacaste in northwestern Costa Rica, but now we're looking northeast towards the Lago de Nicaragua. And here we're seeing the peninsula jetting out into the Pacific Ocean. What makes Santa Elena unique is that these upper mountain ranges are covered in clouds for most of the year. And this cloud line creates a hard boundary, an ecotone between two very distinct communities. Below cloud line is this xeromorphic very dry, tropical dry forest. Uh, Santa Elena is located in one of the driest regions in the country. So the vegetation is very short in stature, very scrubby. But above cloud line is this very classic moss covered um, dwarf cloud forest. And there's been anecdotal evidence over the past 50 years that that cloud line has been rising that there's more cloudless days and the entire region is becoming drier and hotter. But in a place like Santa Elena, it's very remote, access is difficult. It's hard to monitor plant communities in this area. Um, there's been, prior to my work, there's been only one prior um, plant expedition led by, um, led out of the Missouri Botanical Garden. And so how do you study climate change in these remote uh, areas? Another challenge is that woody species are long-lived and slow growing, especially in the xeric dry forests that are, that are occurring below cloud line. But above cloud line, dwarf cloud forests are notorious for their slow plant growth. And so it's going to take a lot of time for there to be any evidence of climate tracking in woody species. But herbaceous species, on the other hand, tend to be shorter lived and they're faster growing. And because of that, as cloud line rises, herbaceous species should be more likely to track changes in cloud line, right? So then with a rise in cloud line, we expect this unexplained turnover in the woody plant community composition and a close tracking of herbaceous plant community turnover above and below cloud line. And this should be evident in the functional leaf traits as well. But to explore evidence of climate tracking in Santa Elena, I led a few trips following this ridge line. 
and every 50 meters in elevation, we sampled soils, air and soil temperature and humidity. And we inventoried plants for abundance and we sampled their functional traits as well. And one trait in particular I'll focus on is specific leaf area because we know specific leaf area responds to these types of environmental gradients. It also tends to reflect plant growth rates as well. Based on my previous work across elevation in other parts of the tropics, we expected SLA to decrease with elevation. And this has been reported for other elevational gradients uh, globally as well. Uh, but what we, what we see is a more nuanced response. For woody species, SLA tends to be high at these lower elevations, sharply declining before increasing. Right, so we're seeing this kind of abrupt functional shift in trait values for woody species. And for herbaceous species, we see a different trend. SLA increases with elevation. But there seems to be these distinct clusters uh, as well for herbaceous species. For woody species, this abrupt shift occurs at 390 meters in elevation. And for herbaceous species, that shift occurs 100 meters higher at 490 meters in elevation. So for woody species, remember we expected this mismatch between the plant community turnover or functional turnover and some sort of climate variable, whereas we expected there to be climate matching between the herbaceous species turnover and some climatic variable. And that's what we found. None of the climatic or edaphic variables we measured could explain this abrupt shift in functional trait values or community composition. Whereas, so what we're seeing here is a possible ghost of climate past. Whereas for herbaceous species, right, we observe this, this shift, this functional turnover at 490 meters in elevation. And that seems to line up really nicely with soil temperature, where we also get this kind of abrupt shift at that same elevation, indicating a possible climate matching. So the, those woody species may be lagging behind these faster, faster lived um, herbaceous species. So what happens to woody species that can't migrate upslope? Well, you'd expect high mortality. And we did find these groves of um, these standing dead trees, right? These ghost forests. So even though the outlook is not good, the value is that this approach could be used to understand and anticipate future changes, especially in tropical forests where access is limited or the terrain is too difficult for the type of continual monitoring that is possible in more accessible places. So in this second example, we explored the changing boundary or the, the changing position of that ecotone between tropical dry, dry forests and cloud forests. But up till now, I really focused on communities on opposite sides of pretty abrupt ecotones. I really haven't talked about the ecotone itself. So in this final example, I'll focus on the ecotone itself and how we might go about studying these dynamic regions and what they might tell us about future plant communities. One particular ecotone occurs at the boundary between tropical dry forests and tropical wet forests. And we know there's quite a bit of species migration between the two forest types, both in contemporary time as well as geological time. At most dry forest trees, for example, evolved from wet forest species. In addition to species migration and movement 
dry forest species can occur in the wet forest biome in these pockets of refugia or microhabitats that are embedded within each forest type. So for example, abandoned pastures in wet forests that are, uh, you know, they're younger secondary forests that might be hotter and drier, they could serve as suitable microhabitat for certain dry forest species. And similarly, pockets of dark, humid, mature, dry forests certainly serve as refugia for some wet forest species. And given this migration and exchange of species, this dry forest, wet forest ecotone is particularly important for addressing ecological and evolutionary questions. We know that in many parts of Mexico, Central America, South America, even throughout the Caribbean, dry and wet forests are adjacent to each other. And when we look at a map of ecoregions or biomes, right, these forests appear to have hard boundaries, but we know that's not the reality on the ground. We know that these ecotones, they're much more subtle and integrating. And so a big challenge is identifying just where are the ecotones. And if 2020 hadn't happened the way it did, I would be presenting data identifying these ecotones throughout these regions, uh, but I don't have that data yet. What we do have are these global climate approximations like precipitation seasonality that's displayed here that we can use to at least get a sense of the climatic differences between dry forests, wet forests, and those transitional forests at those uh, ecotones. As a first approximation of how changes in climate might impact these forest types and their biota. So we'll compare dry and wet forests in terms of climatic variables. And we'll do this by looking at these density histograms, which are a way of representing the distribution of climate values across these different regions. So when we look at mean annual temperature, dry and wet forests um, have pretty similar temperatures, but temperature seasonality is much broader in dry forests, which is not surprising. Dry forests are defined by their seasonality. Dry forests also have lower mean annual precipitation. Remember, this is one of the reasons why they're more ideal for agriculture and cattle people. And dry forests have higher precipitation seasonality. Again, not so surprising, but there's also quite a nice range of precipitation seasonality in what we call wet forests, which I thought is an interesting point because we often assume that tropical forests are aseasonal and that is clearly not true. When we extract the climate for the regions where dry and wet forests intersect, right, you expect these intermediate areas to have intermediate climate, but that, that is not the case. These ecotones have a bivariate distribution of mean annual temperature. So there's some ecotones that have lower temperature, some with higher. The temperature seasonality of ecotones tends to be more similar to dry forests compared to wet forests. Ecotones, um, they do lie in between in terms of mean annual precipitation. And ecotones have this bivariate distribution for precipitation seasonality. So there's some regions that are more similar to dry forests and other regions that are more similar to wet forests in terms of uh, their climatic uh, regimes. So some not so surprising findings, but others that I think are interesting uh, to explore on the ground. And so based on this quick exercise, we can begin to predict how organisms might respond in these ecotone regions. And we can also make some estimations of what their functional traits might look like as well. <laughs> 
So to estimate functional trait diversity across dry, wet, and ecotone forests, I mined existing plot network data across each forest type. And either I collected myself or downloaded SLA, specific leaf area from these global trait databases. And uh, I like SLA because it responds fairly predictably to climatic gradients like precipitation and temperature that we find across these dry forest, wet forest transitions. And I calculated something called functional dispersion. So functional dispersion calculates the mean distance of all species to weighted centroid in trait space. So visually, you can imagine that each species is represented by a dot. The size of the dot represents that species abundance. And the length of the line is how different a species is in terms of its trait value from this centroid. So in plant communities where species have very different functional traits from each other, that community will have high values of functional dispersion. Whereas in communities where species are very similar to each other in terms of their traits, that community will have low values of functional dispersion. Right? And this gives us an idea of how many different ways there are to be a plant in a particular environment. And this kind of approach can help us identify ecotones that may be undergoing fundamental shifts in plant composition. So let me demonstrate what I mean by this. When we measure functional dispersion of specific leaf area across dry, wet, and ecotone forests, precipitation seasonality is the strongest predictor of functional dispersion. Um, but there are a few things that I think are even more interesting. Uh, first, we see that dry forests are more functionally diverse compared to wet forests. And I think that's surprising because wet forests are often thought of as these hyper-diverse systems and dry forests have often been overlooked as these species depopulate systems. But here we're showing that that is not true for functional diversity, right? There are more ways to be a plant in dry forests than there are in wet forests, at least for this one leaf trait. Second, we also see that there are some wet forests that are functionally more similar to dry forests than they are to other wet forests. We also see that many ecotones are functionally more similar to dry forests, right? And there's, other, there's some ecotones that are more functionally similar to wet forests. Right, so we can start to ask, well, why? Is it because these ecotones are climatically more similar? Um, and that's why they're functionally more similar. But um, other questions that we might ask, we could return to this plot and ask, is this plot undergoing some change in its composition? And here we might look at the number and identity of individuals in different size classes, for example. For these ecotone communities, we could ask, what is it about their dynamics? that makes them functionally more similar to dry forests? Again, are they climatically more similar? And for these other ecotone communities that resemble wet forests, does that make them more vulnerable to warming and drying that's occurring in these regions? All right, so these are just a few examples of the types of questions that we can start to ask using these kinds of approaches. So I've demonstrated three ways we can understand ecotone dynamics. Uh, we saw an example of reduced organismal performance in response to the anthropogenic creation of an ecotone. We also explored an example of how we can detect changes in the position of an ecotone in places that are difficult to monitor continuously. And finally, I presented a back of the envelope estimation of where the dry forest, wet forest ecotones are and how they differ climatically and functionally. And in the last few minutes, I'll describe a new initiative that I'm launching 
to understand the dynamics of ecotones. In Area de Conservación Guanacaste, I've set up a number of forest monitoring plots across forest types, and I hope to install additional ones next year. This is a project that I'm calling ALTA for altitudinal transects across the Americas that I hope other people will join in the less popular or less well-studied elevational gradients across the Americas. As part of ALTA, we are measuring things like above ground biomass and functional diversity across elevation including other traits in, a, uh, in addition to specific leaf area. And next year we'll be launching these annual seedling censuses because we think that is where a lot of the dynamics are happening in response to climate change in terms of recruitment, mortality and dispersal. And I'm really interested in the physiological side as well. And I'm hoping to find a collaborator um, uh, to measure things like thermal tolerance, uh, photosynthesis, and hydraulic capacity as well. So some of the questions that we're interested in include identifying just where are the ecotones. Um, we're trying to find someone who can use hyperspectral sensing uh, along with ground truth surveys to identify these ecotone regions. We're also interested in understanding the differences in plant life history strategies, given that competition, the dominant competition is for water in uh, dry forests, whereas it's predominantly for light in wet forests. And of course, we're interested in understanding vulnerabilities to the warming and drying that are occurring throughout these regions. So if this is something that interests you and you have ideas that you want to contribute, please reach out to me. My contact info is on the slide and I'm looking forward to uh, answering your questions or brainstorming about how we can identify ecotones and monitor them um, continuously. So thanks for coming and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Catherine. That was fantastic. Really interesting um, theme about the ecotones. Um, thank you so much. That was great. So we have some questions here in the YouTube channel. Um, here is one from the Tyson Research Center. So this is the crew from Tyson. They're watching this talk. They're really um, uh, excited about this. So the question is, do you know if there are differences in secondary compound abundance in leaves from younger and older forests. Right, secondary compounds that would impact herbivores. I, right, I'm sure, yeah, there's been quite a lot of literature. I'm thinking back to this particular species that we worked with, Cassiaria nitida. Uh, well, that's not something we measured I would guess that there are energetic trade-offs between producing compounds uh, that are used for defense and um, constructing leaf tissue. Um, so we found that leaves were tougher uh, and thicker in the younger secondary forests. So in some sense, that is a structural defense, and there could are likely important trade-offs between structural defense and chemical defenses. And so if I had to guess, I would I would guess that there are probably lower um, concentration of secondary compounds in the younger secondary forests, just based on the additional investment required um, for those thicker, tougher leaves. Yeah, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, now we have uh, two questions from Anna Wessel. So the first one is, in the cloud forest study, were the ground herbaceous species the only one sampled or were herbaceous epiphytes surveyed as well? That was the first one. And the second one is, on a similar note, 
Do you expect that changing woody and herbaceous assembles, uh, assembly, uh, assemble, assemblages, sorry, <laughs> will lead to significant interactions, relationships? Let me answer the first one, and, and then I'll have you repeat the last uh, the last little bit of the second question. So we did do a quick inventory of epiphytes and mosses, just in terms of how much of the tree trunks were covered or how much of the kind of surface area, including rocks, exposed bedrocks or tree trunks that were uh, covered by mosses and epiphytes. So we, it was a kind of a quick uh, census, you know, based on two observers from zero to 100%. And the epiphytes go from close to zero to 100% following that same shift in where the herbaceous species are shifting that um, 490 meters in elevation. And I just want to note that we're talking about pretty low elevations here, and that's because of the proximity to the ocean, right? So the trade winds come uh, from the northeastern direction, and so they're pulling up um, the moisture from the ocean. So that's why you get such low cloud formation in these areas, right? Most cloud forests are like 1,500 meters in elevation, but in a lot of parts uh, of the Pacific coast in Mexico and Central America, you get these low forming cloud forests because of that orographic uh, cloud formation. Okay, and so the, yeah, can you repeat the second part of that question? Yes. Um, the follow on question is, do you expect that changing woody and erasious assemblages will lead to significant interactions, relationships. You mean interactions between woody and herbaceous species? I do believe, yes. Yeah, I often thought about that because my guess is that the herbaceous species are much more shallow rooted than the woody species. It's not a super a diverse, system. So I'm thinking of a few species in particular that are known for their woody species that are known for their having deep tap roots. The soil that these plants are in it tends to be pretty shallow though. So herbaceous species could be bringing or maintaining, helping to maintain soil moisture in those upper reaches. Um, we, you know, roots are the eternal black box. Uh, and, right, there, there's clear differences in rooting depth, but just how different they are um, is, is not clear because of this, the particular soil that these are in, that, that they tend to be very shallow. So it could be that the woody species are shallow rooted as well. Um, and then they could potentially be competing for the same water source. But I would argue that herbaceous species might be more sensitive to drying because their roots are a lot finer um, and possibly more shallower. So I'm not sure if there's direct competition for water, but it could be that they're using just different water depths in the soil. Um, it would be great to have people do addition, do follow up work uh, in this region. It is hard to access. I'm happy to facilitate that future work if this uh, type of project provides kind of a baseline for other studies. Yeah, thanks. Great, here's another question from Ethan. Do you think dispersal limitation syndrome or frequency leads to slow upslope tree migration in this case? Yes, yes, yes and no. Yes, for wind dispersed species because of the direction of the trade winds. 
so the trade winds are northeasterlies. They come uh, down the Cordillera Central towards the Pacific Ocean. And so those wind dispersed species are not going to move up slope right against the direction of the wind. Maybe if there's certain vortexes that are created by topography, but for wind dispersed species, um, the dispersal routes are going to be downslope. For bird and mammal dispersed species, that's a different story, right? Because you do get this movement between, um, between elevations. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's one that we'll hopefully be able to answer next year when we launch these additional plots. We'd love to look at seed rain uh, to, to understand what species are arriving and then pair that with our seedlings plots to understand what species, all the species that are arriving, which survived the seedling stage. And then hopefully we can continue this uh, annual monitoring. And in 10 years, I can come back and talk about what species are surviving, right, to the sapling and adult uh, stages. Maybe at the very end of my career, I will have some adults from those uh, from those uh, seeds. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of work uh, for the next 10 years for you. <laughs> uh, here we have another question from Jonathan Myers. He says, thanks for the great talk. Do ecotones generally tend to increase decrease or have no effect on species diversity at landscape regional scales or are the effects highly variable yeah i'm i'm biased because i work in in this in acg uh, which is one of the few intact gradients uh, where dry forests are continually protected into wet forests and cloud forest systems. So you have a single conservation area that encompasses these regions. I think that's pretty rare. I think in, in Mexico, this occurs as well, but in other places, there's a lot more fragmentation. And so this may act to reduce diversity in an ecotone. Whereas in ACG, the ecotones that I've visited myself, they, can vary. I've been in a in forests where it's 50% dry forest and 50% wet forest, and it's such a bizarre place to see kind of both of you, both these familiar faces, um, in in the same place. Um, so I, yeah, I, I wish we had that ground truth data to be able to answer that question more succinctly, but um, I, I guess I would have to settle for its variable based on the level of fragmentation. So that that I'm going to stick with that as my final answer. That's a great question. I hope we can answer that with the hyperspectral sensing. I think that's one way to get at that question. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, one other question is how uh, permeable are the ecotones for species movement between two these different uh, ecosystems, for example, dry and wet? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it has a lot to do with connectivity between the ecological systems on opposite ends of the ecotone, right? And it's going to be related to the dispersal modes of the species in these uh, different systems as well. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there, right? We, because we're in the early stages of uh, this ALDA project and we would have had a lot of these answers to these questions. Uh, if it hadn't been for last year. So I'm taking notes because these are exactly the kinds of questions that we're hoping to address in this new project. So if that's something that you wanna come um, and uh, 
answer uh, using this Alta network of plots, please let me know. That, that's a great question that we hope to answer more fully. So whoever asked that question, please contact me. Okay, maybe uh, one more question. So in this study, where we're looking at the species migration, like wood species and herbaceous species, do you are you exploring more of the mechanisms how those species are like the winners or adapting better to these novel environments uh, between those two different uh, functional groups? Right. I guess the mechanisms. I mean, as far as mechanisms, what we can say is based on this one leaf trait, specific leaf area. Um, for herbaceous species, we saw SLA increased with elevation. And so what that says to me is that herbaceous species above cloud line are, um, they have high SLA. So this indicates higher relative growth rates, um, right? Maybe faster life cycles, uh, but for woody species, SLA declined uh, with elevation and the SLA values, this isn't something that I pointed out, but the SLA values themselves were some of the lowest values reported globally. If you look at trait databases like TRI or BN. And, and for me, that indicates super slow plant growth. And so, I think for the woody species that can survive these kind of xeric conditions, right? Their strategy, I mean, they're almost pre-adapted to um, a drought conditions. And so they, they may be you know, pre-adapted to the future warming um, and drying that this region will experience. But on the other hand, they may be at their limit of um, what they can tolerate in terms of avoiding cavitation, for example. Um, so I think that's as much as we can say in terms of mechanisms. And I would love for someone to measure things like hydraulic capacity of these really slow growing plant species. I think they'll just blow off the, blow the charts uh, in terms of their, uh, what kind of, uh, cavitation they can uh, withstand. So thanks for, for asking that. Indeed, there is a lot of room to explore in that uh, questions about mechanisms of the species migration. Uh, we have one more question, and this is from Esteban Montero Sanchez. Thanks, Esteban, for watching us. He says, hey, Catherine, have you had a chance to monitor the effects of extreme climate events in the ecotones you're studying? maybe more mortality or so? No, but I would, I think that's such an incredible question because it raises, right? You could make a, a lot of predictions about which species should be um, more resistant to these extreme events. I'm thinking of the I think it was 2015, the major ENSO event throughout Central and South America, where there's these high mortality events reported throughout dry forests in the region. And so for these ecotones, right, within an extreme drought, you would predict that dry forest species are the winners, right? And these wetter forest species, maybe they're at their limit of what they can tolerate in terms of temperature and precipitation, but then when an extreme event occurs, right, they, they are unable to uh, survive. So we can make predictions like that, but that's, that's something we're hoping that this long-term monitoring will end up capturing, right, as these events become more frequent. And so we can kind of test in real time uh, these predictions based on what we know of the physiological differences between dry and wet forest species. So I, I'm, yeah, I love that question. I hope it's something we can expand um, without that. Thank you, Catherine. I say it was the last one, but I think this last one, it's really important because it's, it, it, it's asking about, you know, these foundations about your talk. This is from James Trauger. He says, one last thing. 
please define and elaborate on SLA. Okay, uh, specifically Feria. Yes, it's my go-to trait. <laughs> um, it is measured as the fresh leaf area per unit dry mass. So I like to think of it as a density, a sort of proxy for how dense the leaf is. So high values of specific leaf area. Think of your pioneer species, your fast growers, uh, high photosynthetic rate, um, and very susceptible to herbivory because the leaves are very thin and flimsy, right? Low construction costs. Whereas low levels of specific leaf area, these are your like succulent, very thick leaves. Uh, so they have very high construction costs. Uh, those leaves are energetically expensive and they tend to have a longer leaf lifespan, probably more resistant to herbivory because they're just structurally thicker. Um, and you often find lower values in drier um, more arid regions, whereas you find higher values of SLA in uh, things like rainforests. What I like about SLA is that it does vary predictably across environmental gradients. There was some grumbling in the functional ecology field about whether it really maps onto these trade-offs between planet growth. Uh, so I think it, that is still and being debated whether SLA is a good proxy of, of relative growth rate in plants, for example. But I still think it's a very useful trait because it's inexpensive and anything that uh, just, you know, regular people without a lot of funding, like we tend to be, can measure and say something about a community. Um, I think that's really important. So that's why I still love SLA, despite some of the criticism that it has received. But I think we've all kind of moved on from that criticism. And I think um, we still see SLA as a pretty good indicator uh, when, when uh, you don't have time or funding to measure these really fine scale physiological measurements. So thank you for asking that because I, I love SLA. <laughs> Great, now we have a better understanding what's the SLA. Thank you, Catherine, for clarifying this. Uh, unfortunately, it's time to go. Uh, thank you so much to the audience for all the really good questions. And Catherine, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your fantastic work with us and with the Tyson and Washi community. And thanks to everybody for attending this week's seminar and staying tuned uh, for the next week uh, seminars from the Tyson Som uh, Summer Seminar Series. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, William. Incredible questions. I really enjoyed it.